Hello and welcome to podcast number 25. In this edition, we are going to discuss uh, a little bit about anomaly detection, in particular, uh, the importance that it has in reliability and maintenance. Now, a majority of IIoT devices are actually anomaly detection devices, meaning that they primarily will detect an an anomalies or things that change over time. Um, very few actually do any type of uh, detection, like identifying exactly what the problem is. They'll make attempts, like uh, we'll, we'll go through this uh, here in a second. Today we're gonna do a combination of the dashboard that I'm showing you here and exporting some of the data to explore it in ChatGPT. So we can get ChatGPT and some of its functions to say, what are the po probable causes for some of this? We're gonna keep it limited to about one type of data, uh, but as you can see here, we have a data set. Now this is just energy monitoring for a facility. So this is a, a you know, good size, it's, it's a production facility, it produces um, uh, fuel. <laughs> so it, it's a fuel producing facility um, in the Midwest and uh, this information here has to do with, uh, you know, what, what its max kilowatt or peak uh, demand is today. This is the peak kilowatt hours um, per hour so it'll it'll take the maximum number so that I have a trend. So it, it we do this to eliminate some variability. You can see some of the other stuff here. And up here you can see things very specific. You notice as I go through things that there's highlights that pop up and, and that's what we're gonna take a look at. So I'm gathering this data and this includes, uh, well this whole section here is on AI analytics that is proprietary so I won't show you that. We actually use those AI analytics and combine the different anomaly detection in order to give us some form of classification as to what po probable issues are when we receive our alert emails. So uh, it, it basically says hey you know got this condition it might be one of these things come take a look at me. Of course, this isn't the only data we have. We also have the pure uh, ECMS E1 uh, electrical signature analysis data, so we can actually go in and take a look at a really deep dive into FFT analysis and everything else, which is an expert system. So what we're looking at here is a hybrid expert AI. Okay, so means that there's an anomaly detection layer built on top. Now what's key about it is this system has to train for 15 days before it starts giving me anomalies. That is one of the things that's typical of any type of anomaly detection IoT device. So when you start talking about continuous monitoring systems and so on and they say there's a training period, that training period should accomplish several things. One is it should uh, look at an entire normal cycle for the operation of the equipment. The second thing is uh, that it is going to take that period of time and it's going to model in a physical model just those uh, parameters. Now the bias portion of that is when uh, they set uh, how generic that is. So for instance, you know, if I modeled this period here, which stretches from uh, December all the way to today, which is March uh, 24th. Okay, so I come all the way out here. Uh, that was the last reading about, for, you know, uh, within the last hour. So that is this hour happening right now. So if I take a look at this uh, here, okay, it's taking a look at this data set off of we upload a CSV. We have an edge system. The edge system is the expert system. It's uploading the data uh, in smaller data sets. That's the other thing is when you're dealing with these types of systems is how large are the data sets that are being uploaded and stored uh, because those can get pretty sizey. 
Now in this case, we're talking about you know a few dollars uh, a month in storage uh, in um, one of the more popular systems. In, in this case, we'll just I'll just outline. This one is an AWS dashboard. It's very specific because some of the clients want AWS, some want uh, some of the other platforms. So in this case, um, I have all this information. I have uh, the last set of harmonic content. Uh, this will lag for a little bit because we're doing a lot of things on here again, of course. Uh, but you can see here, I've got a graphical display of what's going on as far as percentage. So that's current harmonics and um, voltage harmonics, particular fifth and seventh. So I'm at about um, just over 3% fifth and um, right around 2% uh, seventh and uh, right around, um, uh, oh, less than half a percent in third harmonic. Well, this particular site is pretty heavily uh, a um, pretty heavily a, a, uh, a VFD type site for, and then you can see out here we've got some additional. So ninth would be the third harmonic as well, which would be lighting. It's almost a lights out facility, uh, and so on. So this is instantaneous. This is now. That's going to fluctuate depending on load. So if I haven't modeled this, I might get an alert if it goes up or down. It would be an anomalous condition if I didn't capture this particular type of thing. So uh, emissions, kilowatt hours, this would be the uh, kilowatt hours mapped. And I don't remember if this is by phase. I think this is overall. Yeah, this is a heat map. So basically it tells me when the heaviest loads are uh, my, I, I use, because uh, I do a lot of programming, I'm looking at the screen, I use a, a dark background. Otherwise, this would be nice and bright and light, but that uh, actually does harm to your eyes. So if you ever talk to a programmer who's looking at their screen a lot, they tend to use the darker screen. Let me mute this. It sounds like I'm popular today. Yeah, it's Sunday, and everybody's trying to reach me, so they can wait. You guys are important right now. So anyways, total harmonic distortion and current. Um, this would be, uh, I believe this should be a, um, a line graph uh, time versus the value over that period. Okay, yes it is by phase. So I can come in here and uh, highlight. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll expand this out a little bit. So it's by uh, time, it's a little bit of lag, so that means that we're probably gonna start lagging in the screen. Sorry folks, I know that's annoying, but I don't really have much control over it apparently, I've already checked. Okay, so uh, in any case, that would normally flash up the values, there we go. Okay, so um, here we are, and then I have that for all the stuff. Let's see, because I know they have power factor correction right uh, about where we are and they keep it uh, there. You can see um, phase two has got a slight shift off of the other two phases. Now this is something that had occurred later on. We know that there was an event that occurred. You can see back here. Um, it had occurred a couple of times and it actually generated outages uh, on this older power factor correction device. So these are the results here. Events occurred again afterwards, but back last uh, year, they didn't have those types of conditions. But anyways, so all of this is here. Uh, let's go back to the summary page, because this is where I'm going to display um, a lot of my basics. You can see it's now running everything. Uh, again, it's going to update. Okay, so um, here's our demand and everything else. I'm waiting for the anomaly detection to pop back up. And then we're going to take a look at an anomaly. Then we're going to go ahead and um, take this data here, the max kilowatts per hour, or we're going to download the, a CSV based on that. And then we're going to explore it. So anomaly detection can take a few seconds because it's looking through the data associated with I want what I want. So. Uh, okay, so everything's updated. 
Um, most recently, it looks like there was some type of event that occurred here that's power factor. Um, let's see, total harmonic distortion, watt total, that's this. Okay, this is watt tot. Um, was uh, 963.8, which is higher for that period of time, because it's looking at daytime, than, uh, than normal. And that would have been on March 11th, which is um, right around here. Well, I can do this and I can explore things and everything else, but let's take a look at some more detail. So if we come in here and we say, let's take a look at our anomalies. So let's explore the anomaly. And it's popping up all the anomalies, uh, including all the way back to, you know, uh, since last August. So right now it's going to focus in. In this case, it's focused in here and since February. So there was an anomaly here, one, uh, and so on. So it's telling me there's anomalies on these dates. So this anomaly was at 6 p.m. on March 11th. And that was that anomaly that was called. This is, by the way, where I can do certain settings. I can explore things. I can take a look at um, certain other things. I can have it send me uh, alerts that are customized by email, that kind of thing, to tell me when, what, where, why. Uh, in the anomaly section, we combine the different types of anomalies uh, that indicate certain types of conditions we're watching for. So I can download those data sets and so on, or download the information off that, or go t directly to the Edge PC, um, you know, either remotely or, or locally in order to explore what's going on. So uh, let's go ahead and we're going to go back to the dashboard and let's take a look and see what some of the things are that we can we can figure out just off of just this data here, the watt tot, which means watts total. I could explore it kilowatts by phase, total kilowatts over time, um, that kind of thing. Um, all of this stuff here can give me indicators and this is what, you know, the, you really don't want your raw data being accessible immediately by just anyone. So basically um, what you end up doing is uh, making it so that your detailed data is, is only available to select people that can't uh, manipulate it, that, that know not to manipulate it. Um, the raw data is king, right? If I take in my raw data, I can man manipulate that. I can do my data science stuff with that. But let's go ahead and we're going to um, blow this up a little bit. It's just showing me as recently as March 11th. Um, don't know why I did that, but anyways, let's. I, I'm going to bring this back down so I can make sure I've got all my data. Um, yeah, it did that. So uh, in this case, uh, I am going to. Ah, oh, there we go. Back to normal. Uh, I'm just going to do this. So um, there's a lot of things I can do up here. I can go in. I can take a look at my data sets. I can download things. Um, I can you know, schedule different types of alerts and alarms and so on, or even that a summary of all this data or each page shows up, right? So let's go ahead um, and here I can, here's part of the anomaly thing, I, or I mean part of the uh, AI is I can forecast. That's a machine learning aspect and say, okay, what's going to happen over the next little bit? We'll, we'll come back to that. So let's go ahead and export the CSV. And it's creating that for me. Okay. And it's downloading it. And that'll be in my downloads folder. So we'll go get that in a second. Let's take a look at forecasting. So here I can say, okay, I want to forecast. Um, 14 periods forward. So that's the maximum for that. Uh, I can build in some seasonality. I'm going to let it do it automatically and I can apply it. 
Okay, so it's just basically giving me some stuff saying, hey, you've got more data than you need for this. Oh, okay. Um, it doesn't want to do it because I have too much. Um, prediction interval, E5. Periods, um, let's go to 20 maybe. Let's see what the warning is here. Ah, uh, okay, so we'll want, we were not gonna do that this time. I'll do that in another one. Um, unless it allows me to edit here, because I, I, I'd have to go back and apply a filter and that's gonna take some time. That would have to be done a little further back. So anyways, let's go ahead, seeing as we have our data now. Um, and we are going to um, leave all this. Okay, and we're not doing that. But that forecast, basically what it will do, there we go. What it will do is show me what it's projecting out. Okay, so it's showing the top 2,500 and the download, I'd have to go back and, and modify this so that I'm taking a much shorter period uh, in order to forecast. So that will show in a future one because I haven't prepped for that for this and there's been some updates. Um, yeah. So uh, let's go ahead. We now have the other, so we'll get out of here. And here we go, we're, we're in ChatGPT. Uh, what we want to do first is we are going to upload that data set. Okay, so here we go. And we are going to come in here and say, explore CSV, display column names and number of rows. Next, identify um, as these are peak kilowatt hour per hour any anomalous conditions from the um, from the median okay that's not the average the median means that any shifts are going to um, move that around a little bit more so outliers have more of an impact than the average right which would uh, uh, the median is like I said is, is that shift so let's start with that so we're going to have it go in there so that we see what it's providing to us okay there we go it didn't like that so let's regenerate again so chat gpt is getting finicky on us today again Okay, so um, let's go ahead and we are going to edit this and say um, display first five rows from the uploaded CSV, including column headers if present. Okay, I will say that might indicate why that's giving me an error. Normally what I would do if I'm doing this as a true data science uh, evaluation, I would have opened up the CSV file myself first, taken a look to see what's present, then do everything. So it's telling me what the code is gonna be for doing it. It's very interesting as ChatGP, how much it's lagging right now. So there it goes, it does have the time, 
um, it's got the rows. Uh, in, in Python, it always starts with zero. Zero is one. So here it is. It's now given me that. Okay. Now, now we know. So um, import CSV provide header column header names identify any anomalous conditions from median um, by download time remove any spaces that's one of the things is uh, because the uh, column names are explicit okay um, oh, for median in what dot it's three T's okay so um, what I'm doing here is now I'm telling it what I want it to look at. So a little bit more than I did the last time. So this way now we can start exploring from a data science standpoint what's going on. Okay. Here we go. It, and up here what it's done is it says uh, replace any, any missing or any spaces that are not part of the name. Eliminate those from what it's calling it because uh, Python is very explicit when it comes to that. Okay, 847 values uh, are outside of that range. So it's going to give a few examples because it doesn't want to overwhelm. Okay, so it's showing from the median. Okay, unusually high or low compared to the median level. Define unusually high or low. So I want it to tell me what it determined was high or low. Okay. More than 10%. Yeah, there we go. So plus or minus 10%, it defaulted to that on its own. That's what's interesting is, is that AI said, okay, um, you know, we're just going to pick a number. What? And really, because it's a trained AI, it's gone back and said, okay, um, what are the average that people are using? 10%. Well, that's what we always use. As a matter of fact, if it had told me some other number, I was going to suggest 10%. Um, this is fuel production over time. Um, identify possible causes for the variations. Include, um, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to let it tell me. I'm not going to give it any ideas. So I could go in and say, show me outages, show me NANs, meaning NAN, N-A-N, means basically that there's no data there. To me, that would be the uh, monitoring device got shut down or, or the plant went through a power outage, things like that. So here we go. Demand fluctuation. So it's giving me reasons why those could go on. And this is basically what IIoT devices are doing now. Now, they'll try to get specific to um, what the different uh, possibilities are. Are. Okay, so if I have a pressure sensor and it's for a particular type of tank, um, as a programmer, I would bias its outputs as to what possible conditions are. Okay, this is a point where everybody thinks bias is bad in programming. Well, we did a hybrid AI system for a pharmaceutical company for detecting failure in production systems. And um, what we did was build in bias 
towards specific conditions that we identified during our study of that equipment, we biased the system specifically to identify the possibility of what those conditions were. Now, the nice thing is for those, we didn't really care. We were just looking to identify that a condition wasn't going to continue up to a point where it would cause problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and let's see if we can do what the um, what the AWS system wasn't able to to do. Okay, so first thing it's uh, first thing I'm going to do based upon um, auto auto fuel um, production, which of these the above are uh, most probable in order and provide an approximate percentage use um, internet data related to travel, vacations, etc. Notice I used etc. That's interesting because it large language models will actually understand what I just said most of the time. Depends on how finicky it is today. Now that that's as I've discussed in the last uh, ones, ChatGPT and large language models can be finicky. Meaning um, today, right now, we have this uh, possibility. You know, all, all it, this level of function. Later today, um, it might drop down to like ten percent or so. Okay, so here's what it's saying. Okay, so demand. So the 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 variations might be due to demand fluctuations due to travel patterns. Forty percent likely, and it's identified um, what studies. Okay, so if you highlight this, it's going to say, "Yep, a travel boom looming." Um, you know, so so it would go look at the statistics for that, and it's given me the order of possibility. Okay, so uh, global economic and, uh, and political events. So what I'm learning here is, in to on top of everything else, I'm learning what's going to affect my um, fuel production, right? This can help me in forecasting. Okay, based based. Uh, on this information, okay, sometimes I have to say the above, depends on time of day. Based on this information, forecast the next um, 15, 30, and 30, 60, and 90 days and graph. Let's see if it can do it. So let's see how far we can get to because one of the things about machine learning and AI is its predictions become less and less um, capable. So it's looking and it's saying, okay, without access to real time, da da da. Um, Okay, so it's doing this and this and this, but let's see if it actually gives me some graphs. Moderation due to high prices. Um, okay, so it's it's identifying what those possibly could be. So it's coming up with a hypothetical. Now what I should have asked is what are the confidence levels of its models, and I can do that after. Please note this is speculative exercise. So it, 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 that's one of the things I keep adding in as guardrails. So here we go. It is creating. Now this is really important. It is creating a Python code that I could actually take, put into something like Jupyter Notebook or NetBeans or uh, basically any of the the the. Um, uh, tools that I use for data science 
and introduce the same set of data, change some stuff in here, make it a little more generic, but basically continuously import uh, possibilities uh, uh, as data moves on if I find this useful. So here we go. So it's giving me uh, relative demand and production based upon the next 15, the next 30, and the next 60 days. And it's saying, okay, increased due in demand due to travel and the resurgence of travel around day 30. So it's saying that um, about this time a month from now, there should be a surge in travel. Um, then it then that will drop off. And then uh, it's, it's identifying some other things that will show. It's saying, hey, there's some seasonal adjustments that are going to occur where demand is going to drop. By the time we hit June, I thought people would be going on vacation. This is an interesting set of predictions. And I'll say, okay, what, what is the confidence level base? Uh, let's say confidence level and RSME and R2 um, of this model. So what I'm doing is I'm asking it some spe specific things having to do with statistics uh, related to um, this. Okay, so it's telling me it's not going to give me able to some of those some ha have some actual historical data. Uh, build a quantitative model. Okay, so it basically it's telling me what I should do next if I want to get this. Um, Okay, so I'm saying performance of machine learning, um, introduce uh, weather data from NOAA for the Midwest, including Illinois, um, Wisconsin. Sin and I. Oh, uh, and I need to remember how to spell Wisconsin. Okay, so now this is all just off of the one set of data. Now imagine I'm taking all of the data that I have available off that data set, and I'm starting to introduce it. So I could go in and get the actual CSV. I could download that off of the. Um, off of the Amazon site, but we would be here for the rest of the day, basically uh, handling what we'll term as big data. Now, total points, I, I believe I have um, 33 columns um, set up for that, including some calculated columns. So I download that data and then I can do all my forecasting. It's outlining the steps. So this is something it didn't necessarily do before. Oh, it's oh that's why it's telling me that I would have to create the model. Okay, so yeah, okay. <sighs> okay, use the uh, supplied data set, data set, one word, um, and um, train test split, which means basically take the data, split off a section of the data, um, random um, 80 train and 20 test. 
So I'm telling it to go back and use that data, take 80% of that data to train an ML, and then 20% to test it, um, use time series um, for analysis, such as a KNN. Yeah, yeah, let's use a KNN. Uh, so we're, I'm going to go ahead and let it do that. Uh, I'm choosing what model to use, basically. Then we'll do another one. If we can, um, okay, it's not going to allow me to do it. Oh, okay. It says it doesn't want, it doesn't like the idea of using it. I'm forcing it to do something. It'd be like saying use neural networks for time series, which is kind of a joke. I, I've when I go to presentations and I watch people talking about how they use deep learning and neural networks for your uh, for your IIoT device to identify anomalous conditions, I start laughing um, because you can't. Okay, so here we go. It's actually going to do it. So it's create it's brought in SK Learn. Um, uh, that is a, uh, and it's using it as a, a, a regressive um, thing. Then it's going to do the training. And then what I'll do is I'll do one more uh, for what we're doing, and then I'll say, okay. But in the meantime, basically, this is what uh, we're dealing with with our IOT devices is, uh, okay, so it's come up with a model. It's still working. Um, that is the uh, RSME, which is okay, and the R2, which is really good. So apparently, it's a, it, it might have almost overtrained. Uh, high RSME is good. Um, I'm sorry, a low RSME is good. A high um, R squared, um, yeah, it has a high degree of accuracy in predicting values. Okay. Use the ML. Oh, um, evaluate best method for series analysis and forecasting based upon the supplied data set and the conditions identified in this chat. Okay, so basically, again, you can see out chat GPT can make mistakes. Consider checking anything important. So again, if I'm doing this, this is just exploratory, right? So um, if I were to use something like chat GPT instead of a tool that I've developed or a tool that somebody else has developed, like, uh, you know, there's there's certain tools I use for energy analysis, like eQuest and Verify, and and some of the other stuff. Okay, so it's saying KNN, uh, okay, okay, Arima. So Arima would probably be the one it likes. Oh, hadn't thought of that. It's Arima using the seasonal. Okay. Uh, Profit is uh, is a, a, a open source, but it's a, a Facebook thing, right? So um, uh, machine learning models, I don't want those. Uh, random force and stuff, I really don't like those. Deep learning, um, those are more used for um, condition analysis, not necessarily. Okay, so... I'm not going to use Profit. Um, I'm going to use the Serima because I'm not familiar with Profit yet. Okay. Rebuild the machine learning model using Serima from the supplied data set. Um, use the ML to forecast the next 15 
30, 60, and 90 days providing confidence intervals and uh, RSME R2 R squared for each. Let's see if it can do it or if I broke chat GPT again. That's the fun part about doing this real time live. You can't practice this because if I come back later and I ask it the exact same questions, guess what's going to happen? I am going to get exactly the different stuff. So uh, let's see. It wants best parameters uh, for this task. Da, 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 da. It's outlining. I, hopefully it's outlining what it's going to do. Otherwise, it's just giving me ideas on what I need to do. But the pause here tells me that hopefully it's going to create the program. There we go. I haven't used Serima. So this is good. This is this should be good. I usually use Arima, um, but I had not thought about using it as a seasonal uh, approach uh, without programming Arima for seasonal. So this this uh, wow, okay. Um, unless this goes another hundred lines, this is already doing good. Okay, R squared is not typical. That's true. Oh, it ran into a problem. Ah, okay. So it's identified an error. It's going, whoops, we made a mistake. Um, so it's going to use without the automatic selection. So this means it'll probably add additional lines. Okay, parameter tuning. The results may not be as accurate as it could be. Great, that's fine. So the nice thing is it's identifying this. Okay, so we're selecting whatever. So the so instead of it doing its parametric uh, tuning, um, it's uh, it, it automatically be a lot of the nice thing about um, what's been happening. Whoops, there's an error. A lot of things that um, train is not defined. Okay, so it's going to have to do something else. Okay, so, uh, but in any case, um, the, um, there we go, it's correcting the data. So as a data scientist, it's, it's fun to watch this because the number of hours you, you spend doing what it's doing right here. And, and its training data is off of other people's work, right? So work done on the, uh, on the internet, usually through something like GitHub, and there's a few other things that we, oh, geez, that we use for, um, for uh, analysis. So it's saying, okay, result is this. Uh, we forecast for the next 90 days. Root mean square for the, okay, is 30. The value represents the average difference between the forecast and actual. So that means that um, that it's got some stuff. Okay, so here we go. And I did not ask it to graph it. So it's, yeah, so it just, <laughs> it built a model. Um, it's telling me out to 90 days what, you know, how, how off it's going to be. Okay. Um, use the ML Sarima uh, model to graph the next 15, 30, 60, and 92 days to compare to the prior graph and show the differences in one uh, graph or uh, and display both. 
Uh, if it doesn't want to do this, um, then what I can do is look at the first graph or take the first graph and then scroll back up and look at the other one. But um, for our purposes, it's easier to be a little lazy. Now, while I'm doing this because I'm paying for ChatGPT, it's allowing me to do all of this stuff. Uh, a, a few months ago, I couldn't have even asked it to do this much. It would have said, you're out of time and space. So what's happening is I am, in effect, renting some space um, on their servers and running this. So I'm, I'm actually using their, um, their AI GPUs and all the other stuff to, to do this. Okay, it's giving me errors. Okay, to resolve this, it's resolving it. So we have a good day today <laughs> with ChatGPT. So it's it's actually functioning as it's supposed to so far. Um, again, I can I can go out. I can take specific data in the field. I can, you know, or or monitor data, whatever. Here we go. So um, this is uh, the original data. And the red line is the Serima fo uh, forecast. So when I do things like, um, and, and I'm going to talk, about, I'm going to be working with a group this week. Uh, we, we've got, uh, we're doing some training on energy stuff this week. Now here's what's important. If I'm going to go ahead and forecast for energy conservation, that red line would basically be what I'm forecasting and then comparing the other stuff to. Now, it's not a good model uh, in this case. You can see it's basically a straight line with some fluctuations, but it's based upon this. And what it's done is it's smoothed everything out. So it's saying, yeah, this is it. So if I were to take this prediction and this was my real data, I would take the differences between that and call that my savings. Um, that's how this is done, right? That's how. That's what measurement and verification is all about. But in any case, we've gone out. Um, there's my um, 15, 30, 60, and 90 day interval. Uh, now we see this here, that red line. Let's go back, all the way back, and see what that other graph looked like other graph looks very different. So this is the one where it created a model based upon other parameters outside. The other one is just a forecast based on this. So I am going to ask it to do one more thing and then we will conclude for today. But um, And then the next time when we come back we're, we're going to uh, explore bigger data uh, and, and what can be done with it in your facility. I mean, so if you're an operations guy or you're an energy guy or you're the reliability and maintenance guy and you want to start doing some level of machine learning and you want to use an AI to do it off of your IIoT devices. Now, last week I was talking about they're, they're not what's advertised. However, if used properly, I can take that data and I can do a lot of things. Whether that system is an IIoT device or it's something else. Now, I could start digging in. So, so basically, let's put it like this. If I'm using a continuous monitoring IIoT device, um, vibration or whatever else, it is forecasting what it's expecting to see based upon the model that it's developed. If it's coming along and I have this red line and right here you can see this deviates, so this is my real data. So the red line says it should be this and this occurred and it's outside of whatever the percentage is that is an anomaly and it's going to flag it. It may then, based upon designer bias, say, oh, we think it's this. And that's based upon the probability of something occurring based upon the knowledge and experience of either the experts that the programmer used, the, the programmer itself, and so on. At MotorDoc AI will only use programmers that are experienced in the field. That's my little bit of salesy thing. So, for instance, I do a lot of programming, and I use my field experience 
in order to bias my models. What does that actually mean? Well, sometimes uh, I might do a little more false positives and negatives and vice versa because most of the time when somebody's calling somebody like myself out into the field, it's not to look at something that's good. It's to look at something that's bad. But So I have an idea of what the failures look like. So I'll say, okay, these conditions have occurred. This is the type of failure. This is how I'm going to build my model. Okay. Um, a lot of times if I'm using a textbook, textbooks are terrible for developing this type of thing because um, you've got knowledge that's been edited, 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 and then produced um, based upon whatever's being the subject of that textbook. And it might be somebody who has no experience. They're just going off of hearsay or what they've seen or general statistics or error builds out versus frontline folks who've actually seen this stuff and understand what the variations mean. That's why, you know, you don't run to a textbook to look certain things up. Uh, so anyways, that's that. So let's go ahead for the Sarima. So if this is lagging like this, uh, we're probably out of sync already. For the Sarima model, introduce the variations that were discussed for this type of facility in uh, earlier in the chat. Redo the uh, ML model and show the comparison graph of prior data to forecast. Use 15, 30, 60, and 90 days. Okay, so I don't have to go that far out necessarily, or I could go and try to have it go out for a year. The further I get out, so the next 15 days was pretty accurate. The further I get out, the more inaccurate it is. So that score of 30 meant that I'm going to have deviations of 30 points. So it scored the forecast values for that period to um, what it saw in real data. So again, it's still, it's still, it, um, this was a recent addition. It, um, ChatGPT has more memory now. So it's remembering more about what we discussed. So here we go. Um, okay. Let's try it again. I might have to tell it to change model type. Let's go ahead and stop it. Oh. Okay. So, Sarima Max. Okay, so, yep. Yeah. It's telling me this is how it could be done using the model. Okay, so I didn't tell it to go out to the internet. Let's see where, how far it goes or if it does it. It doesn't want to do it. Okay. Um, let's try it one more time here. So it made it a little bit further that time. I think we're falling into a time of day. Um, when it's running into problems. So you can see this is the third attempt. And you can see, uh, oh, let's go ahead and stop. I'm going to go ahead and edit this. Change to Sarima X. and obtain regional um, weather 
data from NOAA. Um, if one location is required, use Davenport, Davenport, Iowa. Now, why am I using Davenport, Iowa? Well, because I always tend to jump on uh, O'Hare uh, because, you know, it's local to me. But let's go ahead and use somebody else's uh, location. Oh, there it goes. I uh, had an error and now um, it's going to try it. Okay, so it's read my question now. So I've jumped back and forth. So it's not trying to take everything in order. And it throws me off a little bit that it does this because I'm a I'm a Python guy and everything has to be in order. So I want it to do this first. I have to tell it to do that first. I want this next. And it will only run linearly. If I use some other languages, I can do variations of that. I can run things a little more in parallel. Now, then later versions, the, the like 3. Point, I think we're at 3.12 now. I'm about to release 3.13. Um, those uh, um, variations allow for some parallel. I think it, it started in like 3.9, some parallel um, processing. So let's see if it's going to do it or if it's just telling me how I can do it. It told me how I can do it. It got lazy. Okay. Develop and run the model. Let's see if it can do it. So basically, I'm is saying, yeah, well, here's how you do it. So it's falling apart right now. You saw earlier where it would, it I wouldn't have to say it, tell it to do much. It would automatically run the code and everything else. Well, as the day progresses, uh, with more people getting on to the, um, it, here it goes. It's just telling me to, that I have to do that. It's telling me I can't do it. Okay. Um, What I could do instead, but we're not going to do that right now. What I could do instead is say, oh, never mind. <laughs> it's creating weather features, the fuel data. Uh, here we go. Um, let's see if it does it. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, it still didn't do it. Okay, so in any case, we're, we'll end here. But um, so here's what it here's what it's doing. So I would have to put the data in um, for weather and and uh, and then giving the other factors and what it did back here. Now it, it looks complicated, uh, but now that ChatGPT has given me some insight into a different direction that I would have taken. I mean, that's that's when I get into AI and, and ML, okay? That's, this is where I see the power in this, is that it's giving me ideas on best approaches. It's identifying things that I might not have thought about or, given that I'm getting older, I might have forgotten about. Uh, and it's saying, okay, Here's a forecast based upon what's going on with, um, you know, people driving and all this other stuff. And it accessed statistical information to do this. Um, here, I, when I asked it, I, when I asked it, how, where did it come up with this or what, how is it doing this? Here's, here's its sources. So here's the sources it used. Here's the stuff, so I can go back and verify what you want to do. Because if I were to click on this, it's telling me it's this is what it means. But if I click on it, it might not be that. It might be something completely different. We're not gonna wait, I don't think. It says, uh, tra a travel boom is looming, but is, uh, is the industry ready? Okay, so this is 2021. So it went back to that. Now, ChatGPT and the other uh, large learning models have finally been uh, released onto the internet. So it's basically suggesting stuff. The data is a little dated. Uh, the information is a little dated, but 
this is this is where it's um, it's coming down to to uh, using information. Okay, so have to remember it's a large learning model uh, or a large language model. Um, it's not necessarily a large data science model, right? So it did that, and I can go through and kind of figure out where it got its uh, ideas from. Now, as a programmer, then, I can take a lot of that, say, okay, where am I going to access my data from? It's telling me how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm probably not going to agree with a majority of it. I mean, I forced it to use um, a KNN model, which is meant for class fault classification, and forced it to do a prediction. Um, but it didn't. That didn't perform very well. So then I said, okay, let's do an ARIMA model. But um, that um, that they suggested instead a SARIMA, which is a seasonal, meaning that it should have taken into account weather patterns and stuff like that. But then it didn't. Uh, seasonal means that there's variations over time, which is what we had. These are all the error corrections. Its score is really not that great. Here is our real forecast. So this is what it's forecasting using that model. Now this is why I use, so when I'm going in and I'm actually testing my model, I will take a section of data. Say I go back um, and uh, it's this period of time from 2023. I will take that data, I will train it, I will forecast it and say what will happen in this period of time in 2024 and look at it real data real outputs and then have it measure my forecast against those real outputs now if they vary then I know I have to correct the model and that's where you get into all of the work that data science does and all these AI guys do that's why it's not for the faint of heart uh, there's a lot of work that goes into it the the forecasted model the forecasting model we had it was just an anomalous system with a with an expert system uh, riding along as as my classification system. So I did a I did an anomaly classification and an expert model, meaning that I had set alarms in there. So we entered that data in. We're all running in parallel in order to get a degree of accuracy over ninety percent. Um, the the that took two years to develop almost full time so I had other jobs going on but you know I'm one of those guys I travel I sit in the hotel I'm designing stuff in the evenings I, I don't go to the bar let's put it that way so anyways so we have all of this stuff um, we have this and then when I tried to expand it it kind of fell apart but that could be just because of today it's giving me some ideas um, and then, you know, it's, I've learned already from doing um, these podcasts what time of day that I want to use chat GPT. So earlier is better because as I get later in the day, everybody's doing exactly what I'm doing for this podcast, but they're doing it for real projects or as a hobbyist. So with that, next week what we'll do is we will address some more complex uh, data. Um, I may continue with this. I might actually take um, some other trended data uh, and, and take a look at it, or maybe even we'll, we'll see how what we come up with. Um, I think this is a good direction, so we'll, we'll go off of some trended data. I have some very interesting information related to some turbines. Um, so we will cover that again next week. I was hoping to keep this under an hour. We went just a little bit over. Actually, I was hoping for like 30 minutes. But in any case, I will see you next week. If you have any questions, reach out.